Father, we come tonight and thank you for this place and this time that you've given us, this opportunity to come out to your house and to worship together. Father, I ask you now to be with us all and just to help us tonight, Father. I ask you to uh, continue to be with Dolly tonight, Father, and continue to touch her body. Uh, we ask you to be with Missy tonight, Father, and just uh, continue to watch over and help her and just uh, be with uh, Stevie tomorrow, Father, and just be with these doctors and just kind of guide them and help them tomorrow, Father, and we just ask for a quick and speedy recovery. We just ask now that you open us up to your word tonight, Father, open us up to worship you openly tonight through song, through testimony, and just um, be with us all and help us and just uh, guide us now as we receive our offering and just let it be used for your glory. And We thank you tonight and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
sin stains are lost in this life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. I was standing by the window on one cold and cloudy day. And I saw that hers come rolling for to carry my mother away. Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by, there's a better to that undertaker undertaker please drive slow for that lady you are carrying Lord I hate to see her go oh I followed close behind her Try to hold up and be brave, but I could not hold my sorrow when I laid her in the grave. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. I went back home, the home was lonesome, since my mother, she was gone. All my brothers and sisters crying, what a home so sad and alone. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting. In the sky, Lord, in the sky. I'm now away from mom and dad. Can it really, really be so bad? I'm afraid to be. Just a little home. 
sometimes while on my way I need to stop and say thank you Lord for all you've done for me but one day I'll reach heaven sure oh please let me kneel once more I've got so much to thank him for I've got so much to thank him for so much to praise him for you see he's been so good to me when I think of what he's done and where he brought me from I've got so much to thank him for yes when I think of what is done and where he brought me from I've got so much to thank him for thank him for amen and I do have so much to thank him for I tell you what's the truth, if I was to stand up here for two hours and just constantly go from one thing to the other, I would still miss half of what the Lord's done for me. He's done so much for me, brother, that I can't even remember everything he's done for me. But I tell you what's the truth, I thank God in heaven for his mercy and his love. I thank him for saving me and Donna, and I just thank him for just blessing us, and I just... I, I just thank God for everything. I don't know how other people live without him because I know that I couldn't. Amen. Turn your Bibles to um, Matthew chapter 4 tonight. We're going to continue right along our little journey here. We're taking through the book of Matthew, and tonight we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to be talking about the temptation that Jesus faced in the wilderness. Um uh, being tempted in the deserts, where we're going to go tonight. And, um, and I was thinking about that, and I was looking at that, and this afternoon I was kind of thinking about the desert and the, the wilderness, and I got to thinking about how cold it is outside and our little cold snap that we've had. And, um, and I thought about some of the, the people that are out in our world, the people that are homeless out here in our communities, and, and how they really, um, to be honest with you, they don't have any place to go. You know, we've got, in some places, we've got warming shelters here um, in Stanford, we do have a little um, homeless shelter and different things like that. But for the most part, the people that are homeless are homeless and they have no place to go. And they're just kind of out in the street and they and just out in the elements, out in the weather. And, and, and um, you know, it's hard all year round. But when it starts to get cold and it starts to get winter time, it makes it that much worse. And, you know, and I got to thinking about, um, about some of the things that we do in our country here. We've got all these old empty buildings and all these old abandoned houses that are just set there uh, but they won't let anybody in them and that's just uh, to be honest with you that's just kind of a disgrace to be honest that we have all this and and, uh, and we still have people living on the streets here but um, but as bad and as unfortunate as it is here in our nation um, I think about the rest of the world too and uh, and, and how and how people in the in other parts of the world have to live and have to survive and they don't have government run shelters and they don't have uh, charity or church run shelters and things like that it's just they're out there on their own and they either either survive off what they can find or they die and that's that's just the reality of it and and i was thinking about that because it got me to thinking about um what it would have been like for jesus to be out in this desert or out in this wilderness during this period of time we know that from our bible that he was out there at least 40 days it says in in matthew chapter 4 verse 2 it says after fasting for 40 days he was hungry so we know that he was out there at least for 40 days because he fasted for 40 days and of course uh um, after 40 days of no food no water guess what jesus was hungry 
You know, I go 40 minutes without food or water, I get hungry. I couldn't imagine going 40 days. <laughs> but Jesus fasted for 40 days. And think about that. And you think about um, the desert there. You know, it's, it's hot during the day. It's unbearably hot. Then at night, it's unbearably cold. And Jesus didn't have a, a, a tent or a, or a little shelter or anything. It was, he was just out there. There was just rocks and dirt and sand and maybe, a, um, I don't know, some kind of bush or something out there. And that was about it. He was out there all alone. And that was as harsh as that was, he was out there and didn't eat or drink anything for 40 days. So it was the worst of worst of all conditions you can think of that, that Jesus went out into the wilderness or out into the desert. And, and when you're thinking about that, why in the world would he do that to begin with? Because I think about that, why in the world would anybody subject themselves to that? Why in the world would anybody fast for 40 days? But go that long without food or water. And why in the world would anybody go out into the desert for that period of time and expose himself to all those things? And our Bible tells us why Jesus did it. It wasn't Jesus didn't just say, well, I think it's a good idea. I'm just going to run out here in the desert for a while and I ain't going to take no food or water with me. I'm just going to hang out. That wasn't what was going on. When you look at your Bible in verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted of the devil. He was led by the Spirit. But you notice the very first word there, it says then. Then means that something happened before that. And that something that happened before that was what we talked about this morning, was his baptism. It was all the things that we talked about in chapter 3. And, and, and we, we can learn a great lesson from that. It, it says that then, after all of these things, after Jesus had been prepared that in that way, the, the Spirit or the Holy Spirit told him to do something. He told him to go out into the desert. And not only did he tell him to go out into the desert, he told him why. He said, you're to be tempted by the devil. Think about that. Would we do that? Really, would we do that? Because I'm thinking about it, and I always try to put myself in these situations. You know, even after all of these great and glorious things that happened, if the Holy Spirit came up and said, you know what, you need to go out in the desert, you need to spend about 40 days out there. Don't take any food or water. You ain't, you're going to fast. Would we do that? Would we be that obedient and do that? Now, I'd be like, Lord, are you, are you sure that's what you're saying? Are you sure that's what you want me to do? I mean, Lord, you know, if you want me to fast, I can do it at home. But better yet, even i got a treadmill. If I need to lose weight, I can walk, I can exercise, but don't make me fast for 40 days. Don't send me out in this hot desert. Don't make me do these things. That would be kind of most of our response, wouldn't it? And then top it off, no, you're going to go out there because the devil's going to tempt you while you're out there. Well, <laughs> yeah, don't put any pressure on anybody. So not only you want me to do all these things, but you want me to go out there so the devil can get a hold of me. I mean, when we put it in those terms and when we think about it, really, would we do those things? But Jesus did that, and Jesus did that for each and every one of us. He was willing to subject himself to that because of his love for us and because of his love for the Father and his obedience to God the Father. He was willing to suffer those things for us. He was willing to suffer all things for us. He was willing to endure and suffer the cross for us. Think about that. That's how willing Jesus was to do these things. So he goes out into the wilderness, out into the desert, exposed to all of these elements. He spends 40 days fasting, and he was hungry. And then guess what? Guess who shows up? The devil. Just right on cue. And I'm, I'm gonna show, we can learn from this too because at any time that, that, that we're at our weakest point, that's when Satan's going to show up the strongest. He's not going to come when you're strong and when you're doing great and everything's going all good. He's going to show up when you're at your absolute lowest point because that's when he has the, the most uh, ability to, to, to tempt you to do things, to tempt you to fall into sin is when you're at your absolute weakest. And he'll kind of prowl around. Remember what Peter says. He prowls around. And when we're at that weakest point, he's going to show up. 
and then he's going to begin to tempt us. But what I want us to get out of this very first verse is before we can endure any amount of temptation, before we can endure and fight Satan, we have to be spiritually prepared for it. We have to be ready for it because if not, Satan is going to eat us up and he is going to spit us out. We have to be prepared. Jesus was prepared. His baptism was preparation. His time fasting was preparation for what was to come. Remember it said the the Spirit descended like a dove on Him. Jesus was walking in obedience to the Father. Jesus was walking and living according to the Spirit. And he, He was discerning what God's will was. And He was ready for what came. And and we can be just as ready for Satan when he comes if we will just give ourselves to God, if we will walk in the Spirit, if we will live our lives the way God has called us to, we can be ready too. Because Satan's coming. It ain't a matter of of if he's going to come and tempt us or if he's going to come. It's a matter of when he's going to show up. And he's not going to just come and say, Hey, I'm the devil. I'm here to tempt you. It don't work that way. I wish it did. That way you could shut the door in his face. No, he's going to sneak in the back door. He's going to sneak in sideways and get back behind you and and kind of and sneak up on you. But he's coming regardless. James says this in James chapter 1. He says, when tempted, notice he said when tempted, not if you're tempted. He says, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he, by his own evil desires, is dragged away and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. And it all starts there with that temptation. Now, I think about it, it's kind, of like a, it's kind of like Satan dangling a carrot in front of us. And that carrot is all those things, all those weaknesses, all those things that tempt us. He kind of dangles that out there and, and, we, and we snatch it up. It says here, it says, oh, let me find my place. It says when we are our own evil desires, we are dragged away and we're enticed. And then we wind up out in sin. And what's it say? Desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin in is full grown, gives birth to what? Death. Death. And don't blame God for it, because it's our own evil desires that Satan uses. He gets in our head. But we have to be ready. Jesus is ready, and if you don't think Jesus, if you think Jesus had to get ready and you don't, you're mistaken. Because if Jesus had to get ready, we, we had to get doubly ready. And he says, like he said, he was led by the Spirit. We have to be led by that same Spirit. The Spirit gives us that ability to discern what God's will is, to discern where the attack's coming from. Paul tells us this. He says, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Walk in the Spirit. Live your life according to the Spirit. So, here Jesus is. He's out there. He's fasted. And the old devil shows up. Right on cue. Verse 3. It says, the tempter came to him and said... If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Look what he does there. He tries to challenge Jesus' divinity. Challenge his status as the Messiah. He says, if you're the Son of God, if you're really the Son of God, if you're really who you say you are, And the reason he's doing that is because he is trying to get Jesus to to doubt himself and to question where he stands with God the Father. Question why he's even out there in the desert. And Satan uses the same exact tactic with every one of us. He will try to get us to doubt where we stand with God, to doubt our relationship with God, to doubt what all the things that God has done for us and all those miracles that God has performed and how God has delivered us from all these things. He'll get in your head and say, Well, are you sure? 
Well, that maybe not. Are you sure all that stuff's real? Are you sure all that church stuff is real? Don't put no faith in that. Oh, you got to put your faith in science. Well, guess what our genius science has figured out? The other day they figured out that the universe shouldn't be here because they can't explain it. Boy, they are intelligent, aren't they? That's what they said. It, they said, well, according to science, the universe shouldn't be here. Well, duh. Because you can't explain it with science. Here's where you explain it, right here. God explained it a long, long time ago. I don't need no scientists to tell me where the universe came from. If they would like to learn where the universe came from, maybe they should sit down in a church pew and listen sometime instead of trying to, trying to disprove everything. But Satan will get in your head and he will try to convince you of all these lies, all these things of the world. And that's all he was doing here. If you're the Son of God, if you're really who you say you are, oh, then take these stones and turn them into bread. And he was playing on Jesus' physical weakness at the time, his physical need at the time. He said, oh, Jesus, I know you're hungry. I know it's been 40 days. Yes, I, I, but after 40 days, I could probably just eat the rock, to be honest with you. Uh, but, but Jesus was hungry, and he said, turn it into bread and eat it. If you're the, really the Son of God, do it, Jesus. He's trying to, to tempt him with that. But Jesus, no, he knows what his game is. He knows what he's doing here. He, he's not going to fall for that. And this is what he tells him. He says in verse 4, he says, It is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the reason that Jesus told him that is Jesus understood that any kind of uh, physical thing that's taken care of now is temporary at best. Sure, the bread would fill him up, but he's going to get hungry again. Sure, we could have all the riches in the world, but they're all going to go away someday. And what happens is people put their faith in all these temporary worldly things that, that disappear and go away when there's this eternal thing to put our faith in and that thing is called faith in Jesus. And that's where we're to put our faith. So he's discerning what God's will is. He's given us a, a, a kind of a road map of how, we, how we're to fight the devil. And number one, discern what God's will is through the Holy Spirit. And number two, fight him with the word of God. But in order to fight him with the Word of God, guess what? you got to know the Word of God. And coming and listening to a church sermon on, on twice on Sunday and once on Wednesday or whenever, you can watch it every day on TV for an hour. And if you're not in the Word studying it yourself, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get what you need to fight Satan. You're just going to get a little bitty smidgen, and he's going to eat you up. Because guess what? The devil knows what's in the Bible. Oh, I dropped my bookmark. The devil knows what's in there. He knows what it says. And he knows how to twist it. You think an atheist can twist the Bible? You deal with the devil. He'll twist you in so many different directions, you don't know if you're coming or going. So learn God's Word. Write it on your heart, is what the Bible says. It's our weapon. Hebrews 4 says this. This is verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword or double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered, laid bare before the eyes of Him whom we must give an account. We must give an account. And then, of course, Paul, the armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, he says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have to learn God's Word. That is our weapon. That is how we fight. You ain't going to beat the devil by just going out here and saying, Oh, get away from me, devil. Just get away. You defeat the devil by, in the name of Jesus, God's Word says, Whatever it is, Get away from me. Because guess what? In Christ, you can take authority over Satan. We see Jesus do that later on in this passage too. So, we're going to be successful. We've got to know how to fight. 
And Jesus, he repels the first one. He says, all right, get away from me. I've dealt with you already. You think Satan's just going to go away? He's going to quit, go home? He's going to take his toys and go home? He's coming back again and again and again and again and again and again. I ain't going to say that. (laughs) Yeah, I will. He's kind of like the bad relative that that just won't go home. (laughs) Come tear up everything in the house, eat up all the food. Sit in your good chair. (laughs) He won't go away. He will keep coming back every time. (laughs) <laughs> like I said this morning, we got to have some fun. We can't take it too serious. <laughs> but here's the thing. He's going to come back over and over and over. That's why Peter tells us to be diligent, to be um, self-controlled and alert because he's prowling around, looking to see how he can attack, looking to see how he can get in there again. And he's going to use the same tactics over and over and over again. He may change it up a little bit. But he's going to come back. This is what he does. Look at verse four or verse five in Matthew chapter four. He says, "Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the high point of the temple." Look what he says again: "If you're the son of God, there it is, the same old thing." Because he knows if he can get in Jesus' head, he's got him. And it's the same thing: if he can get in your head, he's got you. If he can get you doubting just a smidgen, just a little bit. He's got you. Because doubt leads to fear, and fear leads us to do crazy things that we would never dream of doing. But he says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, Satan quoted the Bible. He quoted the Bible. He actually quoted Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12. But Satan twisted what the Bible says in Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12. Because in Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12, God is telling His people about His love and His care for all of His people. And see, Satan saying, Oh, Jesus, God said, If you throw yourself down, He's going to send His angels to protect you. So do it. Throw yourself down so that God will send these angels and you'll be lifted up. Hmm. See, there's a couple of things at play here. We have to understand God's Word and understand what the Old Testament says. Back in Malachi, it says, I'm going to read you Malachi 3 1. It says this See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And what the Jews had done for centuries, they had interpreted that verse to mean that that the Messiah was going to descend from the top of the temple uh, surrounded by angels. And when he did that, that was the sign for all of them that they were to bow down and worship him, anoint him as king and lift him up. And if they had done that, there would have been no cross. There would have been no crucifixion. There would have been no salvation for all of us. There would have been no hope. And Satan knew that. But guess who else knew it? Jesus knew it. Jesus knew it. He wasn't going to do that. You know, it's been great. Boy, it felt good, wasn't it? Have all these people worshiping you and saying, Woo! Look how good I am. See, it was Satan was playing on that human instinct, that self-serving human instinct to glorify ourselves, to use God's glory for our own glory, to use God's name for our own glory. It's a kind of um, I call it the kind of the, the sow your seed bunch. They're sowing their own seed, and they're and they're abusing God's word and abusing God's name in the process of it. They're lifting themselves up. 
and not God. And that's what Satan was trying to get him to do. Jesus wasn't having nothing of it. He wasn't having nothing of it. That's what he says. He gives him a little more scripture. He's going to educate him a little bit. He answered him, this is verse 7, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And he's quoting Moses. Do not put your God, your, the Lord your God to the test. I think it was Moses. I believe it was. Huh? Yeah, Deuteronomy. Whew. Had me thinking. Had me doubting there myself. <laughs> but here's the deal. There's another message we can take from this. Yes, God loves us. Yes, God cares for us. Yes, God wants to protect us. But when we make bad choices, those bad choices have bad consequences. And when we test or tempt God, we're probably going to suffer the consequences of our choices. And that's what he's saying. That, that, that's across the board. Now, can God work through those bad choices and those bad consequences to make things better, to improve things? Yes, absolutely. But there's still consequences to everything we do, every choice we make, good or bad. And that's what he's saying here. Now, think Satan's going to quit now? Jesus done got him twice. Ah, he's going to come back one more time. Give it one more shot here. He's got him this time, he thinks. He's got it all worked out. In verse 8 he says, Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he says, All of this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Hmm. Different tactic there, isn't it? He's telling him. I mean, Jesus is the Son of God. God's already promised him everything. It's all his dominion. See, Satan is offering him a shortcut. No suffering, no waiting, no cross. You can have it all right now if you want it. All you got to do is bow down and worship me. All you got to do is bow down and worship the flesh. Worship yourself. Satan don't care who you worship as long as it's not God. He don't care. As long as you're not worshiping God, that's all he cares about. See, he gives us shortcuts. And a lot of times, we mess up and take those shortcuts. So we think it's going to get us somewhere. The only thing that gets us is a mess. Gets us in a mess. It goes back, you know, I said it a few times, I call it the Burger King mentality. We want it our way right away. It don't work that way. And Jesus knew it didn't work that way. Jesus knew what he had to do. He knew that there wasn't any shortcuts. He knew that it was going to be hard, that there would be suffering. But he knew in the end it would be worth it. And he was pretty well done. He was tired of it. He had all he wanted. And he takes authority over Satan. Verse 10. It says, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the simple fact that Jesus commanded him to go away, he didn't have a choice but to go away. Because see, he was subject to Jesus. See, Satan gives this illusion that he has all this power and all this control. But he is subject to Jesus. And guess what? If you're a child of God, he is subject to you. The only power that Satan has over you is the power that you give him. That's the only power he has. If you don't give it to him, he can't take it. If he gets all, you know, starts throwing a hissy fit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to get away from me. Try it sometime. Now that don't mean he won't come back because he will. He'll come back. He may bring two or three with him. He'll come back. But 
Jesus is always there. You see, we, we won the war. Don't let Satan deceive you. So he commanded him, go away. And it says, Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. And then the chapter goes on. It talks about some different things that went on. Jesus went around. But the very last verse of that chapter says this. It says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Sound familiar? John the Baptist this morning. Where do you think John got his, his material from? Jesus said, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. If we need to come and we need to repent, then we need to come and we need to do that right now. We don't need to wait. If there's anything that we need, we need to come. I ask you, Satan came right now the tempter came could you resist that temptation could you do that could you stand up to him could you use God's word to defend yourself do you know God's word that well living a spirit filled life are you wandering around out in the desert somewhere because when you're out in the desert Satan will make you think you're all by yourself but you're not God's with you God's always with you if you're his child he is with you don't let Satan lie to you and tell you otherwise so that's what I want you to do tonight I'm going to get Michelle to put some music on back there and I want you all to spend some time with the Lord tonight if you need to come down here and pray come down here and pray if you need me to come pray with you throw something hit me upside the head and I'll come and pray with you whatever you need I would encourage you to give it to the Lord tonight if you all just bow your heads and pray and just do as the Lord leads you tonight. All right, you all pray with me tonight. Father, we come tonight and I thank you and praise you for allowing us to be in your house and to come and to worship together. I thank you for all the many things that you have done tonight in our lives and I just ask you to continue to be with all those that are sick, Father. Continue to be with all those that are struggling. I ask you to be with Angie, Father, tonight and just help her and just to, and, and be with her, Father, as she's dealing with the, the doctors and the medicines and all the different things, Father. We just know that you can touch and we're just going to give her over to you tonight, Father. And we're just going to ask that you be with all of our families and just help us all, Father, to do your will in all things. We thank you tonight in Jesus' precious name. Amen.